you got to adopt automation and AI or you're going to be competing in a war with knives. <laughs> that's kind of how that's going to be how it is. Right. And right now there's still this huge bifurcation of companies that leverage AI and those that don't. But 10 years from now, I think it'll be very rare to see anyone still exist who's not leveraging that technology. Hi, Joanne. Thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. Super excited to be here. Brilliant. Um, so I guess to begin with, one thing I noticed is that there are so many new AI companies around, particularly generative AI companies. Um, do you have a sense of how you might go about categorizing them? Are there some important areas that are developing? Sure. So from our standpoint, we've been investing kind of in applied AI for the last um, almost 15 years now. Um, there's three areas that we typically look at um, broadly. One is the application of AI, so what we call intelligent automation, meaning automation of workflows, tasks, decision making. Um, think of uh, AI applied to marketing or sales or to an industry like legal or logistics. Um, that's one big bucket or fintech. That's one big bucket. The second is um, machine learning infrastructure, which is all the tooling and all the all the um, uh, the, the infrastructure necessary in order for companies to capture data, clean data, process data, and use that to uh, leverage machine learning and AI. And I think the third bucket, which I think is super interesting, um, that we are spending a lot of time in is looking at cybersecurity because, you know, as um, the tools get more powerful, as AI gets more powerful, uh, tools that are misused are similarly are getting more powerful. And therefore, how do you counter add things like fake content that's easier to generate and less costly to generate today? How do you counteract hackers are now trying to do model poisoning or data poisoning uh, and a whole bunch of other, you know, how are you defending against phishing attacks that are now sounding more realistic, right? Uh, you get an email saying, please click this link and um, et cetera. Uh, so those are, there's another really big bucket that we're excited about. Okay. So automation and infrastructure and also cybersecurity, these all seem like really important topics. Maybe we can get into the details of some of these later on. But um, are there any particularly important uh, business use cases that you've seen have just uh, emerged over the last year or so? Uh, business use cases. So I, maybe I'll comment on um, the application side. What I've seen companies pursue from a strategy standpoint, uh, there are two main things that uh, stand out to me. One is around um, a time to market strategy, meaning when you are competing in, let's say, marketing and you're using, you're building this new AI solution uh, where you can um, offer something that hasn't existed before. If you're competing in like a really noisy sector like marketing or sales, the companies that are fast to market or first to market and are, you know, kind of going about the land grab strategy, I think are, have an opportunity to get those customers and build deeper. Right. And what they'll do is they'll build workflows, et cetera. That's like one broad area. And there's some other opportunities today where there's like very, that's very little, that's touched very lightly by AI. So for example, procurement is one where um, there hasn't been that much AI innovation or innovation in general. Um, and so I think from a comp competitive standpoint, you can still go and build a better product and compete there, land grab, and then build deeper. Um, that's like one broad strategy that I've seen in the app side. The second is like rethinking business models. Um, so for example, a legal firm right now charges an ungodly amount per hour for, you know, lawyer services. And, and so their revenues are scaled by the number of lawyers they have. But with, I think, Generative AI, what you can imagine is a firm that just has 20 lawyers that are making a billion dollars in revenues because 80% of what they're doing is using machines and the 20% is all about customer experience and customer service. And you can change the dollar per hour billing model to something entirely different. Uh, and I think so there's opportunities to reinvent certain industries by completely changing the business model thanks to this technology. 
that's absolutely fascinating. I think anyone who's ever been, like been charged hundreds of dollars just to be sent some kind of uh, standard like legal form is going to be very happy if there's sort of innovation in, in the legal industry. Um, are there any other uh, industries or sectors that you think have been particularly affected by AI or, or by generative AI in the last year? Well, we're seeing innovation up and down the stack in all the three areas that I mentioned. Um, there is also a big bucket of engineering automation uh, or augmentation that um, I haven't mentioned. And I think this especially applies to the engineers or maybe not the 10x engineers or even like the Silicon Valley engineers, but the engineers are doing more mundane stuff um, like integration building or um, kind of SRE. So like thinking about, uh, you know, site reliability, like the engineers are doing all the other stuff um, and there's a ton of them. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities to augment and automate some of the work that they're doing. And um, companies are more willing to buy software um, to augment or automate those pieces because they're less core um, to the company in terms of product building. Okay. So I, I do certainly like the idea of automating, like maybe the boring bits of engineering. That certainly seems uh, a, a great thing to do. Like if uh, you don't have to do all the, the, the boilerplate code, then that's a, a definite win. Um, before we get into sort of the details of like uh, particular roles, I'd like to talk a bit more about um, companies and how we go about finding good companies. I have to say, um, just looking around at all the, the new companies cropping up, it seems like some of them are just like, well, we put a website around the open AI API or something. It seems like it's, it's not really like a, a, a very substantial company, but there are some very cool things happening at the same time. So, do you have a sense of how you go about finding uh, what are the quality companies out there? For us, which, you know, we, we invest at the very, very early stage, meaning primarily the seed stage when companies don't have revenues, right? Like 85% of our investments are in companies that don't have revenues that haven't discovered product market fit. Uh, and so there's very little data. data. Um, the way that we approach that is we take a very founder first perspective, like is this founder, um, they have some kind of secret around the problem they're trying to solve. Do they have the persistence and tenacity to go about it, especially because the, the, the ecosystem is moving so quickly and what they built today could be irrelevant tomorrow. Um, do they have a initial team that is really high quality? Um, that can work together really well to move really quickly. Like those are some of the things that we really focus on. We do a lot of references. We, you know, talk to um, people that they worked with before. Uh, we talk to potential customers and prospects. We have a customer network that we rely on. And so that's like one big bucket of um, invest, investing strategy. I think the other big bucket is we spend time on problem statements um, that we think broadly have the opportunity to be uh, reinvented. For example, the you know law firm example is one such um, opportunity. And we do this across the stack and look at where um, this new technology can make a really fast impact uh, and then understand like what is the strategy they're pursuing to be able to capture that market quickly. Okay, so um, I guess at that early stage, you really are just sort of investing more in potential than what's actually there already, which is, uh, which is pretty fascinating. Yeah, you know, and then I think that's it's a hard mandate to match the founders and the founding team to an interesting problem. But oftentimes we will spend years and years digging into a problem area before we invest. Like, for example, Jasper, which is one of the companies we let the seed in, um, we looked at marketing automation and marketing technology since 2014, try to invest in companies that were automating content creation in 2016 and 2017 um, unsuccessfully. And then when we met Jasper before, way before all this hype, it was just very obvious because we had been looking at that space for a long time. Um, and Jasper, of course, been a huge success story for marketing content creation. Um, are there any other companies that um, you've seen that are particularly promising? In our portfolio, we have companies um, including AnyScale, which is um, a unicorn company that is helping uh, companies like OpenAI reduce their compute cost, right, with 
such large language models, there is a lot of costs associated with training them. This was the biggest innovation, in my opinion, um, mm -hmm. since 2017 when transformers were um, available to use as an architecture framework. Uh, it's really the cost. And in 2017, we invested in companies that were trying to do some of this, but they did it themselves, right? Versus use someone else's off-the-shelf models. And that was really, really difficult for a young company because you don't have that much resources, right? So I think a lot of what OpenAI and others have done is like reduce the cost by doing their own training and offering that off the shelf. Any scale is helping OpenAI reduce that cost. Um, that's one example. Cerebros is another one in our portfolio. They're taking a hardware approach, um, meaning they're offering GPUs the way that NVIDIA does. And they're also offering models as a service um, for certain use cases. And in that case, the high level problem is still that compute is really expensive. And how do we reduce that cost um, as quickly as possible? Cerebrus's perspective is that a hardware approach is the right one, whereas any scales is, you know, more of a software approach. Um, those are two other examples. But we have 50 plus companies in our portfolio that are um, leveraging AI significantly or are enabling the infrastructure. And yeah, so both those companies you mentioned, so AnyScale and Cerberus, it's like really quite low level infrastructure stuff. So it does seem that um, AI is causing changes at, at lots of different levels of the, the market, like from that low level infrastructure all the way up to applications and stuff. Okay. okay. Uh, so um, for organizations who are considering uh, buying AI products or services, are there any things that um, you think they need to consider before they buy? At the end of the day, whether someone has AI or not, um, what is what really matters is like, are you moving the meter on a business metric? Business metrics are typically revenues and costs. And so when I think about um, the purpose of, of AI technologies, it's really to serve a end business problem or end user problem. Um, so I think that's like the most important thing um, to consider. I think the second is um, the balance between, culturally, the balance between making sure someone's comfortable using AI as an augmentation tool and how do you kind of reduce the fear of full automation. I think that's something that's like culturally talked about quite a bit. My experience is such that no one has been fired <laughs> because of an AI solution, but organizations have gone more efficient or can do more with fewer people. And I think that's a great thing. Absolutely. Um, and so that's uh, kind of interesting. You mentioned the idea that um, a lot of organizations don't necessarily want a, a full AI solution, but they actually just want to make things more efficient, reduce the number of humans involved. So uh, can you maybe talk about the trade-offs between having a, a full AI solution versus this hybrid approach with humans and AI together? Oh, I don't think there's full AI solutions, period. I think most of the solutions are hybrid in nature because um, there is a, there's very few instances where you don't need a human interface layer. Um, whether that is a law firm that, you know, AI can generate a contract for sure, right, to like some high accuracy today, but you still need a human to present that and provide the customer service. Um, similarly, if you have a sales team that's using AI to write emails and reach out, you still need a, a person to think through, am I prioritizing the right things? You know, how do I make sure the customer is having a good human experience on top of, you know, some of the automation? So I don't, I don't actually see that many areas where there is full automation in the company. Um, in fact, the, as the AI automation piece is commoditized, the role of the person becomes even more important. This seems similar to your point about how you need to start with um, thinking about like revenue business metrics um, rather than starting with thinking about AI. So um, do you maybe want, just want to expand on what you were saying about how um, this customer experience is very important? So um, is this, do you start with trying to have goals around customer experience and then figure out how AI can be built into that? Or do you have any thoughts on uh, how you approach this? Uh, managing a good customer experience with AI? I mean, I think the one of the one of the things to explore, like for a startup, a startup has relatively limited funding. Um, it can only hire so many people. And so how do you make sure everyone is ultra-productive 
and, you know, creating more opportunities and um, that they usually can. So one, one of the things they could do is build a stack of solutions where, you know, if you're on the marketing team, use AI to create content, AI to do some of the lead generation um, um, and, and also help you understand where the channels that you should kind of focus on from a, from a marketing um, spend standpoint, right? Like that, that can all be done by machines. Um, but then the person still has to come and think about the brand, think about like the interface between marketing and sales, think about the community building um, and all the other aspects of it. So it actually frees up their time to do that. Plus all the, you know, marketing um, specific things they had to do before, right? That's like when, what I mean by um, this kind of augmentation. But I do think one important question that founders are now asking is, hey, like, let's assume we're going to adopt all these AI tools, right, to like help you be more productive. Make sure, like, let's think through what is the importance of each person's role, right, from a human standpoint. Like, how do we start to quantify and qualify and how do we improve um, what we're uniquely best at? So you mentioned that cybersecurity is one of the areas that you've been investing heavily in. And I think um, when it comes to um, security and uh, data privacy, these are uh, big concerns when it comes to AI. So um, do you have any advice on how organizations can go about mitigating security or privacy risks when they're using AI? Well, we have, so we have um, a number of companies that are helping with privacy as a big problem. I think it's going to be a problem for every single enterprise um, to solve. Uh, there's lots of different ways they can go about it. Um, you know, everything from understanding who has access to what data within an organization to, you know, maybe translating that data to something else that mimics the original data set to thinking about collection methods, um, interfacing with their consumers and a whole set of issues around, around it. Um, but what that means is that organizations will need a tooling layer to manage privacy concerns and privacy issues. And I think that's a huge opportunity for startups. Some of the uh, companies you've been investing in are uh, infrastructure companies that are going to help it make it easier for you to build your own AI tools. But then there are also companies available that will sell you AI services. So like Jasper is going to sell you an AI service, but any scale is going to help you build it. How do you go about deciding whether you build AI or whether you buy it? Do you have good engineers? <laughs> do you have good engineers? Do you have the resources? Do you have like the organizational capabilities to prioritize this. It's the same way that, you know, a lot of Silicon Valley large companies prefer to build in-house because they have very strong engineers and the rest of the world oftentimes prefers to buy um, because maybe they have fewer engineering resources, right? Like engineering resources is still a massive bottleneck and the degree of that is different across different companies. Okay, so really you just got to decide, are you going to be playing to your strengths in one direction or the other? Yeah, like if, you're, if your strength of the company is something else, like you're selling insurance products and like maybe your strength is your go-to-market team, then perhaps you will want to just, you know, buy solutions for, for that to play to your strength. In terms of um, if you are going to buy in some products or you're going to buy in some services, um, then I think a lot of these AI startups, they're pretty new and maybe there's a high failure rate with new companies. So um, do you have any recommendations on how you can judge uh, the financial health or like the longevity of some of these startups that you might be wanting to work with? Well, for us, we, we're in the business of funding these startups that have no money. Uh, so that is, uh, that is what we do. We have a, on the enterprise side, over a 75% graduation rate from, you know, nothing to something, uh, C to Series A. Um, so we help our companies increase the chance of success by helping them recruit, helping them get customers, shaping go-to-market uh, product market fit strategy or discovering product market fit strategy, helping them with go-to-market and all that stuff. So we try to increase the chance um, as a venture firm. Uh, as a large company trying to um, buy solutions in this space, I mean, one of the things to look at is who are the investors right behind these companies? Okay. Uh, I suppose uh, if your company's invested, then uh, it's a good sign. <laughs> uh, all right. Super. We're biased. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Nice. Um, all right. So I, I'd like to talk about like uh, the different kinds of um, generative AI that have sort of uh, cropped up. So I think um, ChatGPT has obviously been like the the most high profile hyped um, kind of AI recently. But there are sort of lots of different um, AI uh, media types things going on. So um, do you see uh, GPT being dominant for a long time, or um, are you seeing the adoption of other types of generative AI? I think that chat GPT was a significant moment for the ecosystem. It was, you know, we've been investing in all sorts of applications of different types of machine learning methods for a very long time. And the reason why chat GPT was still very, very significant is because it was a moment where the mass market saw the powers of AI, people who never could imagine manipulating it in AI systems, who couldn't spell the word AI, can use it. So it kind of democratized um, this technology, which was only accessed by very, very few people before, right? People who worked at Google, who graduated from Stanford, who had to study computer science. That was the cohort who leveraged it, and now everyone can. So that was like a significant moment. And that moment led to a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people a lot of companies thinking about now what do we do? Like, how are we going to make our businesses and our lives better um, by using this technology? I think that was culturally a very significant moment. From a market share standpoint, I think that there is going to be um, a, a larger fragmentation of available AI technologies to use, whether that's produced by OpenAI which is still one of the leaders, but compared to two years ago, when we first invested in Jasper, for example, OpenAI has lost market share simply because a lot of other players have come in and offered a bunch of stuff, um, you know, Google or Amazon or startups. And um, and I suspect that trend will continue uh, because there's going to be, you know, foundation models that are uh, more and more commoditized. There's going to be smaller models that are cheaper to use and optimized for different use cases. There's going to be proprietary models that enterprise will build because the compute costs will have gone down even more um, and that'll be used for their businesses. So I think we're going to see a diverse set of models uh, created by different people. And I think that's a positive thing. Absolutely. Uh, just, well, this huge increase in competition has got to be good for everyone, except maybe the people who were previously market leaders. Um, okay, so... Um, uh, the one thing I notice is that a lot of companies seem to be focusing on either uh, maybe text generation aspects or they focus on image or they focus on video. And there seems to be this separation of um, different media uh, that uh, companies are interested in. Do you think that's going to continue or do you think um, there's going to be some crossover in the future? Well, some of the techniques are different for the different types of data. Um, but I do think when enterprises are adopting AI solutions, if especially if they deal with different data types, they, they will want a multimodal or multi, you know, type of, you know, uh, asset solution. Um, what is still a bottleneck, I think, on the tax or not on the text, but on the image and video side, is that the compute cost for those is much more significant than text. These are much more, much um, richer and more expensive data types, and I think we're still at the forefront of some of the technology innovation for video especially. Um, so we'll see likely the cost of creating videos come down, especially autom automatically. Um, and I think the the chat GPT point of that is still to come. Okay, so maybe like the, the good video stuff is still in the future. So maybe we'll, we'll look forward to that then. I mean, I haven't seen anything that can just generate a short clip on demand that looks Great. Not yet. Okay. F fingers crossed for the future then. Uh, all right. So uh, the other thing that's um, had quite a bit of hype uh, in the last few months is the idea of AI agents. This is kind of going a little bit beyond the traditional chatbot. Uh, so also GPT, for example, got a huge amount of hype uh, around sort of April and May. Um, how do you think um, the future of well, what do you think the future of AI agents is going to be? It's a super interesting technology. I think there's a number of really early stage teams that are exploring use cases 
like I spoke with one yesterday and, you know, they were thinking about what is the vertical to apply this to? Um, and I think that's still an exploration to, to be determined. My sense, though, is to offer an enterprise solution that accounts for a large part of automation. They probably have to use, you know, agents plus machine learning, classical machine learning, plus, you know, workflow building and just integration building and all other types of technologies combined to really help, let's say, a real estate agent do his or her job holistically, right? It's not a just an agent can do something, maybe he can do some things better, um, prioritizing tasks, executing on tasks, thinking about the sequence of tasks, stuff like that. I think that's like really, really powerful for, with agents. Um, but there's a whole host of other things, including what is the interface? You know, what is like the integration to other systems that a startup needs to think through? Okay. So yeah, I, I guess uh, just the ability to automatically send an email is, is a nice prototype if you actually want to really automate someone's full job board, maybe tasks. That's like, that's a pretty serious challenge. So uh, yep. I guess we might be waiting some time. It, it's for that. not that, like, I think the, the misconception is that this technology is going to magically give you a product in a very short period of time. I think it can give you a really interesting demo. But to have an enterprise-ready product that accounts for a lot of other things that people care about in the enterprise, there's still a lot of building to do on top of what this technology is enabling, right? The same, the same idea that, hey, if you're just a wrapper on top of OpenAI, you're probably not providing that much value. If you're just a wrapper on top of some, you know, agent technologies, you're probably not providing enough value. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that sounds sensible advice. Even though the agents are, you know, a little bit newer than what OpenAI has been building. So can we talk a bit about uh, the business models of some of these new uh, AI companies? Uh, can you maybe talk me through how these um, how these AI companies make their money? I mean, they're, I don't think they, they, they're making money any differently. The foundation layer, they're, you know, charging on a per API basis for a lot of them. Infrastructure, if it's a developer tool, maybe they're building some enterprise on top of it and charging as a subscription or um, kind of some kind of usage dependent thing. If you're like an application, most of them are charging on a, you know, monthly or annually annual basis. So that hasn't really changed. We haven't seen um, companies that have evolved significantly where they can say, hey, I'm going to change the economics of a law firm. And this stuff, instead of charging on a per hour basis, we're going to charge on a per product basis. We haven't seen that mature yet to the point where that is actually happening. Okay. So a lot of it is sort of a simple API subscription to things. And maybe do you think there's going to be any innovation in this space in terms of how these um, AI companies are going to um, change business practices or change, change how, how uh, they're monetizing things? Um, I think if the business model innovation is happening, then uh, yes, I think the business can have a different pricing structure. But I, again, I don't think, you know, AI businesses versus non-AI businesses, that's not really a distinction in my mind, right? Like it's the AI businesses are using a cooler tool that maybe can reduce product development cycles, that can reduce go-to-market costs, that can make things more efficient, but it doesn't, it's not a business, right? It's just one small, one small, but very important part of, you know, a, it's like, hey, you're going to war and you invented gunpowder, you have an advantage. Or the ones that are still, you know, <laughs> doing a <laughs> hand to hand combat. But does that mean your war tactics don't matter anymore? Probably not. <laughs> Especially okay, yeah. if the gunpowder is now open source and everyone can use it. <laughs> <laughs> I like that open source gunpowder. <laughs> uh, cool. Uh, so I, um, I'd like to ask you a little bit about uh, economics as well. Because my sort of um, view of this is like sort of since maybe 2008 or so, we've had low interest rates and low inflation. And that meant that a lot of tech companies um, could sort of delay monetization in favor of growth. And that sort of changed last year. So now there's this sort of big pressure to make money. I'm wondering how this is going to play out in the AI space. Yeah, well, I think the high inflation and high interest rates affect the investment market um, first, first and foremost, and also everyone across the board, right? So I think venture capital, for example, is 
scarcer um, today. And I'm not sure that's, my guess is not because there's not dry powder, but because there is um, just more hesitation to invest until people feel more comfortable um, that this company is going to be an enduring company. Whereas in 2021, everyone just kind of invested very quickly because they knew the next round was going to get marked up and um, because of a low interest rate environment. So that's trickling down uh, across the board. I think venture funds are taking longer to raise. Um, venture fundraising cycles are also taking longer. Um, you know, so all of these transactions are slowing down, which puts the onus on quality. And I think that's a good thing because now companies need to think about like, what is it that they're going to do to differentiate and make money and have a much better product way beyond than just saying, hey, I'm an AI company, right? I don't think an AI company is anywhere sufficient, you know, to get you funded. Okay. So that's interesting that just saying, hey, I'm AI <laughs> isn't just going to get you that um, that instant sort of uh, cash. Uh, all right. Interesting to know. Um, so I'm also curious about the the partnerships between different companies. So um, Microsoft have sort of developed quite an interesting relationship with OpenAI is perhaps maybe the most high profile example. Are there any other uh, partnerships between uh, companies that you've seen that are interesting? Well, I think the, the hyperscalers like Microsoft and Amazon and Google are all going to have their own research labs, if you will, like OpenAI is Microsoft's. Yeah, I'm being a little bit more uh, edgy here. Um, but Amazon will have the same, Google have the same. Google has more of an investment there internally. Amazon is partnering with a bunch of organizations, you know, to do some of this um, in addition to investing um, in-house. Uh, so like the, 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 the folks that are selling cloud services that have a lot of budget, that have the ability to absorb compute costs, they're all going to be foundation model um, providers, right? And whether they're monetizing significantly on, the, on these foundation models or they are offering it because they want to sell other stuff, in their suite of, you know, things they're, they're selling uh, is TBD. Uh, but I, 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 would, I would not be surprised to see more partnerships with any of these large players. Okay. So uh, watch this space and see what gossip comes out of it, I suppose. Uh, all right. Uh, so for people who are interested in getting jobs in the AI space, um, do you have a sense of what sort of roles these AI companies are hiring for? So there's there's a couple of different categories. One is like folks that have actually trained large language models. There's very few of them. And that's why there's so much demand for like alumni coming out of OpenAI and others because they actually have that cap you know, capability. Um, there's also just like what everyone was looking for before, which are like engineers or data engineers, manipulating data, processing data, understanding how to use data at scale. I think that's still a very high in demand job. And then there's like, other um, types of engineering work, which is more um, like, oh, like how do you put some of the outputs of AI in context, right? Th this can be in the form of data analysts or uh, even business uh, folks that are using some of these AI systems. So I don't think it has changed all that much from before, with the exception of a higher demand for folks that have trained large language models, which is a very small fan of it. Okay, so it's that kind of extreme machine learning engineer kind of position that uh, seems super in demand, but maybe there's only a small number of roles. And beyond that, it's the standard sort of data engineering, data science type stuff. Um, so uh, related to this idea of roles, are there any particular skills that you've seen are particularly important? Well, as, as more and more automation happens in a company, I, you know, I go back to what does the person bring, right? So in my law firm example, if I were to build that law firm, I would hire 20 lawyers that are exceptional at customer service. And maybe that wasn't the criteria as much before because, you know, they had to be skilled at understanding all these documents and stuff like that. And they still do, don't get me wrong, but like what really, really matters from a competition standpoint is that the clients have to feel like they're amazing, right? So relationships, relationship management, relationships matter um, more than before. Um, so I, I think that's a really important thing. I think engineers are always going to be, um, a bucket of talent that's high in, in high demand, uh, because everything in an organization is becoming, um, somewhat technical, right? Whether you're 
using an AI powered business solution, it's great to understand how it works and the limitations and how do you manipulate that. And having that background, I think is super, super useful across the board, whether, whatever role you're taking. Okay. Um, I really like that idea that uh, customer support skills are incredibly important. It goes back to this idea you were talking about earlier. That this is really just like, it, it's all about customer experience and that should be your, your big business goal. Um, okay. So um, because Data Camp's audience, we have a lot of uh, data scientists, data analysts, and I've had a lot of questions recently about, well, saying, okay, so I've got this role in data. I want to get into AI. What do I do to transition from one area to another? Do you have any advice in this area? In transitioning from one role to the other. So someone who's non-technical, who maybe want to learn some other stuff. Oh, so actually these are a lot of people who do have this sort of technical data background, but then I was saying, okay, well, I've done data science. Maybe I want to try AI and uh, what do I need to do to... I think it's the same exact thing as skill set. I don't think it really changes. I think what people need to do is be up to date on the latest innovations, read research papers or have ChatGPT help you re- read research papers, um, you know, and, and make sure that's, that they understand what's going on. I think that's like probably what's happening. I think the folks that have studied data science and are practitioners are very well equipped and well suited to to be significant contributors in this new world. I mean, it's just the same, it's the same transition if you're a classical machine learning engineer and you're working with structured data to now, you know, deep learning is, an, is a capability. Like you probably have to, you know, do some learning and reading around how to use deep learning and how do you manipulate, you know, those systems. But the fundamentals are still very similar, right? Like at the end of the day, an AI is a prediction machine and you're taking data, you're creating something to predict something else. Um, and so the questions like the methods are different. In the, t- in the case of text, you're predicting what is the next sentence. In the case of um, finance, you're predicting what could be the risk score. Um, and and so at, at the highest level, like nothing has really changed. That's good to know. I like that. It's just maybe a little bit of a different, different Python code, but um, a lot of the sort of similar ideas. Um, okay. So uh, before we wrap up, can you tell me what is your number one favorite AI company? Ah, that is a hard question. <laughs> I'm not sure I have a favorite. Um, I I am very excited for our portfolio companies, um, but I also think that I'm more excited, even more excited at just the number of people and entrepreneurs who are looking to start a company, who are working on something interesting has really exploded. And that's a net benefit to all of us and to this ecosystem. Uh, so that's probably what I'm most thrilled about. All right, brilliant. So the kind of the global benefit rather than any individual companies. I like that. It's a good uh, uh, good answer with those kind of avoid uh, picking favorites. Um, okay. Uh, is there anything you're working on right now or anyone you're investing in that you're um, particularly excited about though? Uh, we are making a lot of investments. Uh, we, you know, we have been investing in applied AI for the last 15 years and we continue to do that. So I think if folks are starting early stage companies, especially you know, at the formation stage, um, we'd love to we'd love to chat with them. Fantastic. And do you have any final advice for uh, organizations wanting to adopt AI? You gotta adopt automation and AI, or you're going to be competing in a war with knives. <laughs> that's kind of how that's going to be how it is, right? And right now, there's still this huge bifurcation of companies that leverage AI and those that don't. But 10 years from now, I think it'll be very rare to see anyone who still exists who's not leveraging that technology. Um, and, and so my advice would be understand your own capabilities, understand your talent pool, understand where, where are the low-hanging fruits that you can start working on um, and just know that it's either you know, you evolve and adopt and, you know, figure out to comp- figure out ways to compete or probably won't exist. <laughs> um, nice. Okay. Uh, 
that's that's brilliant advice. Yes, uh, figure out uh, where your strengths are and just figure out how to adopt things. All right, excellent. Uh, thank you very much for your time, Joanne. It was great having you on the show. Thank you, Richie. Talk to you soon.